Hello, Margaret. Hi, George. How are you? Hi. Good. How are you? Good, good. How are things in Los Angeles? Muggy and hot. Too uh, hot. <laughs> yeah, it's that time of year. I don't know about global warming on your part of the world, but here it's real, I'm sure. Yeah, we've been getting global cooling in Santa Fe. It's been like oh, one of the nicest. You. Oh, it's been the coolest summer ever with lots of nice thunderstorms. And yeah. I, I should uh, say before we get too much into this that I'm talking to, to Margaret Wertheim, who's a science writer based in Los Angeles and the author of um, a couple of really good books, which I have here at my desk. Pythagoras' Trousers, God, Physics, and the Gender Wars was your first book, right? Yes, that's right. Yeah, and, um, and then The Pearly Gates of Cyberspace. And you know, I was trying to remember when I first met you, and I have two theories, and one of them is that it was in Cape Town, South Africa, at the World Parliament of Religions way back in 1999. I think that's where we first met, yes. Yeah, yeah and we'd, uh, I think we'd just emailed before that. And yes, yeah. Yeah, that was quite a, quite a show, the World Parliament. Yes, I mean, I sometimes wonder what these things produce. There was an extraordinary number of good people there. Yeah. Um, but you do, do sometimes wonder what is the long-term effect of these great convocations. I was at another one recently um, in London, where I got invited by an initiative that Richard Branson has started to start a project called mm -hmm. the, Glo the Global Elders Project, which oh. is to sort of brainstorm ways to save the world from all kinds of woes and miseries. It was an amazing meeting, scientists and philosophers and environmental activists, and we sat around for three days and discussed what were the great problems facing the world. Um, mm -hmm. It was the most amazing time for us. <laughs> wow, that sounds great. <laughs> and, you know, the, the, so many science and religion convocations are like this, where, you know, philosophers and theologians and neuroscientists and quantum physicists sit around um, and have yeah. spent a time for three days. <laughs> well, yeah, then you wonder if you've, if you've changed the world or not. Yes, and, yeah. yeah, I don't think... I, I, we were both... Um, giving talks at a science and religion colloquium there. Yes, one of these temple yeah, initiatives. I, yeah, so that was, that was interesting. And well, oh, the guy who organized that, Clifford... Um, Cliff Matthews. Yeah, Clifford Matthews, great guy from, from Chicago, and then put together a, um, a book with um, all, all of our various presentations. But yeah, mm. I don't know that I changed the world, but... Maybe the world changed me. I had a wonderful time. It was my first time in South Africa. It's just a fascinating country. Yes, I'd actually been to South Africa before um, the Templetons had actually run a whole series of workshops there about, about two years before you and I were there, and oh. pat particularly because George Ellis, the relativity theorist, who is, who is a South African, and he, oh, yeah, he's at the University of Cape Town, right? Yes, and he, he actually won the Templeton Prize a couple of years ago, which I thought was... Oh, yeah, and we should... Yeah, the Templeton Prize, of course, is at uh, approximately... Is it a million dollars? It's actually, I think, now worth about a million and a half because it's... Specific. About a million and a half uh, put out by the John Templeton Foundation for... Well, they used to say progress in religion, right? The prize and, is formally given for progress in religion, yes. Yeah, I think they've rephrased it in recent years to something a little different, but um, I, I guess that was during, it's not always for, for scientists who are, who are trying to reconcile science and religion in some ways, but I guess those are the um, prizes that have gotten the most publicity, like Ellis and then Paul Davies. Um, and, John, and John Polkinghorne's won it. And, John uh, Polkinghorne. John, John Barrow and, won it this year, I think it is. That's right, John Barrow, and um, yeah, the year before, the... Um, Oh, the guy that invented the, invented the laser. Oh, yes, Charles Town, yes. Charles Town's yes. right, right. Yeah, wonderful guy. Yes. Well, the funny thing is, yeah. I mean, the prize was originally set up for progress in religious thought, and I think the very first year it actually went to Billy Graham, and it's been given over the years to people like Billy Graham. Mother Teresa. Wow. Yeah, Mother Teresa. But then, I think it was about ten years ago, they gave it to Paul Davies, the English physicist who's right. written a famous book called The Mind of God about the laws of nature, and it got so much publicity that year, it, and it had never really got any attention before, 
And so yeah. I think that they've been giving it to scientists much more frequently over the past decade because that seems to be the one area that actually gets people, the, the press and the media interested, you know, giving it to yet another conservative theologian doesn't seem to excite the media. Um, yeah, yeah, because it also, yeah, it kind of implies, the implication is that there really is some kind of deep connection between science and religion, which, you know, is, a, is you know, definitely something that, you know, at least newspaper science writers are going to glom on to. And, and, of course, I'm pretty skeptical that there there is such a connection. I've often thought that science and religion are about as um, orthogonal as, say, uh, architecture and, and <laughs> stamp collecting. But, you know, and John has kind of a similar similar jaded view, and I think a lot of the people that, that tune into Science Saturday are getting, you know, probably tired, or at least, even if they agree with us, they know where we where we stand on this, and I sort of suspect that you have a at least a slightly different nuanced view, which well, would be good to I talk think about. My view on the science and religion wars, as it were, is somewhat different from, from a few other people's, and I should preface this by saying, specifically on um, the Blogging Head site, that I am actually an atheist, I don't believe in God, I'm not an agnostic, I was actually raised mm -hmm. Catholic. Uh, but have come to believe through long, hard thought that God doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. But I have a very different view on the role of religion in society and, and the value of it. I do actually think religion has a place in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and having grown up with Catholics who basically spent their lives fighting for social justice, I think that religion can actually be a positive force yeah. in our world. Yeah. And so I disagree with people like, you know, Sam Harris, for instance, or Richard Dawkins, that religion is simply an unmitigated evil. You know, yeah. Of course it can be, but it doesn't have to be. It can also be a force for fighting for you know, rights of impoverished and disempowered peoples. Yeah. But I think vis-a-vis -vis science and religion, there are some ways in which I think that the science world doesn't want, in some sense, to acknowledge some of the resources that religion brings into people's lives. Mm -hmm. And one of them is this, that I think most people who are not hardcore materialists, of which Dawkins is the you know, epitome um, of hardcore materialists, yeah. I think for most other people, they have a sense that there is something in the world that is real, that is not just mm -hmm. explainable in terms of atoms and genes. Yeah. People have a sense that there is a me, there is this I, there is this self, right. and in, you know, in the theological context, that self sort of becomes a soul, which has a relationship with some kind of, you know, extra material consciousness, mm -hmm. God, whatever word you want to use for it. So, for so you're talking about something that that in principle uh, would never be explicable uh, in, in a material way or through physical science. Well, it's not so much whether it's explicable or not through physical science it's whether it's a real entity and it, it seems to me that there's a very weird thing is going on in the contemporary scientific world where there seems to be almost a desire to deny that this thing called the self or the thing that is referred to when I use the word I or mm -hmm. me there seems to be this strange way in which science at the moment is trying to deny that the self the meanness of me has any reality that somehow if we simply explain the neurophysiology of consciousness that somehow we will have explained everything there is to be explained about this notion of me mm -hmm. now it, it i happen to be a metaphysical materialist i don't believe that there is anything that lives on beyond the death of my body but I do believe that this thing that I call me, mm -hmm. that, that I mean when I say me, actually isn't something whose interesting qualities can be articulated through neuroscience. I do happen to believe that the me that I feel and experience arises through neuroscience. Yeah. But I don't actually think that we can... There's a lot of interesting things about the meanness of me that actually cannot be explained by you know, fMRI measurements. And I think that's, that is the fundamental tension in science and religion that a lot of non-scientists um, feel. They feel that there is a self that is real, 
that it has true qualities of its own. Mm-hmm. And they don't really care what's going on at the neuro- neurological yeah. level. They want to sta- understand the self within the context of an overall cosmos, which includes what, for some people, for many people, the overall cosmos includes some other higher power. Right. And I think we need to try to understand why people... That, that the sense of self, I think, is a very real and fundamental part of being. Well, yeah, that's the strong... I mean, it's really the bottom... Our bottom line, in many ways, it's like... You know, the one thing that's most real to each of us is our inner subjective yes. experience. And, and there's just been this constant tension between how can you possibly describe something, you know, the subjective objectively, which is what yes. you would um, seek to do in science. But, you know, personally, I find, you know, some of Daniel Dennett's um, attempts to do this pretty persuasive, even though I think he would, um, you know, quickly agree that. Um, you know the problem's far from solved, but I think he makes some pretty, you know, pretty good inroads with his multiple drafts mm-hmm. theory, where the, you know, sort of looking at the the self or the I is kind of this, um, what he calls the the center of narrative gravity that's cobbled together as kind of a a simulation, a serial simulation running on top of this parallel computer called the brain. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that to me isn't so much denying the existence, but, you know, really, really trying to explain it scientifically. Okay. But, you know, then again, you know, he wrote this book that I think is just wonderful called Consciousness yes. Explained. Mm-hmm. And, and when you get to the end, it's like, well, yeah, you can kind of see how, you know, he's you know, really right on the edge, possibly, of, um, you know, breaking through. But then you always get back to that that inner sense of, you know, there you are reading this book. And <laughs> <laughs> what does this mean? One of the things that I, I sort of find quite amusing is that all of these guys who are trying to deny, as it were, in some sense, um, that the self is a fundamental part of reality are themselves taking up an awful lot of space in the public arena. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I have to tell you a little story about this. I was once giving a talk on this subject, and uh, at the end of the talk, some young physics students put up his hand and asked a question, and he said to me, basically, I don't believe the self exists. Prove to me that the self does. Mm. And I said, okay, so let's get this clear. You really don't believe that there's any such thing as the self, do you? And he said, no, I don't. And I said, okay, then we'll we'll move right along to a question from somebody who does exist. I presume (laughs) there's somebody in this room whose self does exist. And I think, you know, that is the fundamental tension here. If you don't believe that there is such a thing as a self, how come it is that you're operating in the world at all? And it seems to me that we have this sort of... This is actually, I think, a question that cuts across many of the great issues in science today. For instance, you know, the whole notion that are we a great simulation in some, you know, extraterrestrial computer. Oh, yeah, right. The, computer. Yeah. You, you saw that piece that, that my colleague John Tierney wrote in the Times yes, about that. Yes, I was highly amused. <laughs> but there seemed to be a lot of this kind of talk going on at the moment. That Oh, yeah, there was, like, you know, I, I first heard that actually... I mean, you know, I, mean, I don't know when I first heard it. It's such an old, you know, it goes back at least to, to William Gibson's novel Neuromancer, yes. right? And, uh, but, yeah, and then, of course, the, you know, the Matrix, the yes. Matrix well, uh, series of, um, but, I, but D- Davies, Paul Davies, when I saw him, it was actually in, um, in uh, C- Cambridge, England, uh, a few years ago at the, you know, at that science and journalism fellowship did one year and, and Davies was it was before he'd written this new book The Cosmic Jackpot and he was kind of mm. kicking around this idea that you know with you know basically you know Alan, Alan Turing when the concept of the universal computer shows that a computer you know can in, in principle simulate anything that can be precisely or algorithmically described and therefore a powerful enough computer would be able to simulate the whole universe to the extent that, um, you know, the simulated creatures inside it would have no reason to think that, um, you know, this wasn't the real universe. But the the twist that I first heard from Davies was that um, it's mathematically more likely that our universe would be a simulation than not because, I mean, 
sort of the easy way to say it is it's way easier to simulate a universe once you have one of these computers than it is to, to make the real universe in the first place. So once you have a universe and a civilization that's been there for enough times, they'll probably develop this computer technology. And all it takes is one civilization somewhere in the real universe <laughs> doing this, and then they can just simulate as many universes as they want, and then the simulations can simulate more meta-simulations, and wow. <laughs> you know, the thing that I find funny about this concept, George, is that it's just a reinvention of the idea that we thought's in the mind of God. Yeah. Just transformed into a digital domain, or into a, huh. into a, into a digital dialectic. I mean, this idea that somehow we are just, you know, we, that the real universe is some, as it were, Super, super human level of beings that they used to be called gods. <laughs> so, you know, one of the things I find interesting about so much contemporary science, you know, sort of science fiction shading over now to science, you know, reality um, discussions are that they are just really secular techno reinventions of old mythological concepts. Hmm. I mean, this is this is really no different than the idea that you know Plato's cave concept that yeah. you know, we just that the material world is not the true reality that there is this transcendent reality of which the material world is some kind of pale shadow yeah. and the real the real domain is the transcendent domain which you know in Plato's time was the realm of it, oh well sure and it, goes, and it goes back to the Gnostics too right and well yeah the, ne the Neoplatonists yeah. I guess you know that's all pretty intertwined yeah. in this notion that we're sort of you know, in our, with our corrupt flesh mired in the material world and we're kind of these little bits of spirit or star stuff mm. that's, you know, trapped in, these, in our bodies and mired down by flesh and we want to break through and transcend through the spheres into heaven, but then you're saying, you know, that's sort of what cyberspace yeah. is. And, well, I mean, I think a lot, yeah. of, the, a, a, <laughs> like a lot of this actually oh. goes back to a fundamental tension that the Greeks debated two and a half thousand years ago, even more than that. I mean, it goes back to the to really to the dawn of Western philosophy, with the pre-Socratic mm -hmm. Greek philosophers, and that's you know the debate that went on between the Parmenideans and the Heraclitans. And you know, the Parmenideans believed that chain that all the change that we experience and observe on Earth is just illusory, and that underneath the changing right. mortal decaying material world there is a true transcendent reality of changeless timeless forms and you know yeah. that's the tradition that gets incorporated into platonism and then neoplatonism and then you know neoplatonism in a in a christian context which ultimately actually is what gives rise to to modern physics the notion that the realm of mathematical law is the realm of transcendent ideas. This is just, as it were, the mathematization of the old Platonic Pythagorean and ultimately Parmenidean tradition. Right. And that, that was one of the themes in your, your first book, as I recall, the Pythagorean, Pythagoras' trousers, where um, you know, it was kind of arguing that um, science, or specifically modern physics, really, really grew out of um, you know, I, I really Western European... Um, uh, Christianity, right? Protestant well, the, Christianity, the theme pretty much. Of my book was was really that the tradition that we now call physics, which is basically the desire to find, or the quest, the discipline of trying to find mathematical relationships underlying physical phenomena, that this grew out of the Pythagorean mm -hmm. tradition, which was was. Right, that everything's mathematical and all yes, is numbered. Yes, as Pythagoras famously said, that all is numbered. And what he meant by that was that behind patterns of the material world that we could find timeless mathematical relationships. And in his day, he, he, he just thought it in terms of literally ratios. So he was specifically looking at things like the ratios um, of the lengths of strings on the lyre, which produced the harmonies of music, or, and he transposed this into the concept of the harmony of the spheres, which gave rise to the idea that the cosmos, particularly you know, the distances to right. the stars and planets, w was a set of ratios. Yeah. And this idea of cosmic harmonies w was really the notion that there is mathematical laws underlying the structure of the cosmos. And yeah, and that he, it, it was interesting too because it was... Um I mean, it was really, he had, a, he had his own cult, basically. It was like a religion based on this. And well, one of the things that's fascinating about Pythagoreanism is it really is 
the the seedbed of modern physics, um, but mm-hmm. it, w- it was also a religious society, and for the Pythagoreans to learn mathematical knowledge was really to receive divine knowledge, and you had to be properly cleansed with, you know, a suitably clean, healthy, vegetarian lifestyle. Ah. So that so it's something that you um, that you you apprehended in some you know spiritual transmission more than. More than empirically. Well, it was both, really, and that what was interesting. I mean, the he was experimenting with the uh, the strings. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Pythagoreans really did believe in going out and measuring the world, yeah. but they they didn't see because they thought that measuring the world was actually apprehending the divine part of the world. Yeah. So it was, as it were, through number that we got access to the divine realm that transcended material reality. So for them doing mathematical science was actually a form of religious practice. And that's why it's fascinating that we've got people like Stephen Hawking and Paul Davies talking about the mind of God today because that's not actually a new thing in our culture. Yeah, that's it's really what the Pythagoreans back. were saying. And yes, it, and and really the claim of my book above everything else is that the, it, it's sometimes said that the West doesn't have a great mystical tradition. You know, the East has Confucius and Lao Tzu, mm. um, uh, the West has Buddha, and it's always often said that the, the West doesn't have a great, as it were, mystical leader. And the, one of the claims of my book is that, well, we did actually. It's called, he, his name was Pythagoras. Oh, okay. And, and that mystical tradition actually was different from the Eastern mystical traditions because it had this empirical basis to it, and that tradition of empiricism gives rise to the science that we now call modern physics. Right whose links with religion we've kind of forgotten, although we haven't entirely forgotten, because as a culture we still are fascinated with this idea that physicists are somehow special yeah, to God. Yeah. The fact that we pay so much attention to someone like Stephen Hawking when he talks about God, even though Hawking himself says he doesn't really believe mm. in God. But, but yet we have a fascination with this linking between physics and divine reality, and I think that is because this is actually a unique Western tradition that has played out in our culture, um, first overtly and now covertly, for over 2,000 years. So you sort of, you compared it to the priesthood, both uh, in the the Pythagorean sense and then also when you look at uh, uh, Western Europe around the time of Newton when kind of... uh, you know, modern modern science or modern physics was was really emerging. It also really seems to have come out of, or at least some historians argue this, out of the uh, kind of Protestant tradition. Yes, well, the, the linking between science and religion in the uh, 17th century, the 16th and 17th century. I mean, it was really yeah. There was no. It was all all one thing. There was no real delineation. It was you know, this it was natural theology. And indeed quite the opposite, really, that in fact, if you read people like Newton and Copernicus and Kepler and even Galileo, they're really quite Mm -hmm. overt, particularly Newton, who is a religious obsessive, in saying that what that they were doing was actually being a kind of alternative priesthood. They saw themselves as as illuminating the work of God as creator. And they saw yeah. that, as it were, that the glorification and the, the spelling out of the magnificent ways in which God had created the universe according to mathematical laws, that this helped us to understand the greater glory of God, whose ultimate function in human life was to be God the Redeemer. And there's a really mm-hmm. interesting, uh, there's a Jesuit historian of science, a guy called Michael Buckley, he's written beautifully on this subject, and he says he points out that mm-hmm. Traditionally in Christianity, there were two conceptions of God, God as creator and God as redeemer. And that up until mm-hmm. the scientific revolution, God the redeemer was the one that all the you know, theologians and intellectuals focused on. And with the birth of modern science, what you had is, as it were, a coming to the fore of the role of God as creator and a refocusing, as mm-hmm. it were, on saying, look, we can see God's great work spelled out through his creation. And isn't this wonderful? Right. And but, but at least in the 16th and 17th centuries, people like Copernicus and Newton understood that the purpose of articulating the glory of God as creator was to shore up the idea of God as redeemer, you know, the person right. who's going to be responsible for getting us all to heaven at, you know, at the end of time. But what you have basically going on you know, in, in our time, in the 20, you know, 20th and 21st century, is, is a complete obsession with God as creator. So all we talk about now yeah. is the Big Bang and what happened 
to bring the laws of to, to bring the manifestation of the laws of the universe into being at the time of creation a billion years ago. Right, but but, but God more becoming a, a metaphor for the uh, the um, universal laws or the mathematical yes. laws. And, and and as this Jesuit Michael Buckley points out, the problem with that is that it it completely loses the whole point of what God, the function God served in the first place, which was to be the redeemer of mankind, at least in Christianity. Mm. And so if, if, yeah. if God's only function is to be God, the creator, and he doesn't play any salvific role, then it, it actually becomes a kind yeah. of meaningless concept, at least in the, in the context of Christianity. And so that's the fundamental tension, yeah. that if you obsess on creation and, and looking at how the universe is created, you don't ever really bridge that um, chasm that gets you to salvation, and which brings up the whole issue of morality. And so I think that is mm -hmm. why it seems to me that there is a fundamental problem with the science and religion discussions as they're currently conceived, because so many of them are about somehow looking for signs of God in things like you know, the cosmic microwave background radiation or quantum physics or chaos theory. Yeah, right. But none of that actually gets you to the point of salvation unless you go down the path of somebody like Frank Tipler, who tries to prove... Yeah, yeah Tipler wrote the... What was, it, what was the name of his book? Um, the Physics of oh, Immortality. The Physics of Immortality. And now he's got a new one out called The Physics of Christianity. Oh, I didn't know that. The Physics of Immortality. Wow, that was really... I, I just loved the book. I mean, I thought it was yes, kind of this wonderfully too. absurd um, tour de force where you can show how you can take um, take physics and extrapolate it to this just um, wild well, what, vision where, yeah, I mean, you basically... Well, what it tries to, yeah, yeah, you're getting immortality. Tries. Immortality finally comes as a computer simulation, right? <laughs> so we're back, well, what, to, back to, like, John Tierney's... Tierney's piece about are we living in a big simulation, and then Davies is using the idea of a simulation as this hope for for immortality. Which, you know, again, I think you pointed out in, in your book, uh, Pearly Gates of Cyberspace. That's that's not a, such a new idea either. Um, you know, cyberspace is salvation or this substitute for heaven. For heaven. No, no, well, again, it seems to me to be just a sort of reimagining in technological terms the old the old Christian, particularly Catholic, idea oh, that, okay. that you will eventually go to heaven. You know, so on one hand, we have heaven in, in, in the form of the, uh, the, the theory of everything in physics, like maybe superstring theory, and then on the other hand, we have it in this, this vision of, um, of this um, cyberspace simulation that's so rich that we can you know, simulate whole universes and might be a simulation ourselves and might be able to live forever. Yes. I hadn't realized that there was really this, this common theme between your two books. <laughs> yes, I mean, I didn't, I didn't set out to have that as a common theme. I mean, I think yeah, the, thing, yeah. the thing that I did set out to have as a common theme, and I think actually runs through a, a lot of these issues, is the question of what is, the, what is reality and how do we... Dis ha what is the language with which we use to describe reality? And that's yeah. really, I think, for me, the the most interesting question of all is the question of what one would call epistemological power. What is the disciplines and the language and the ways in which we decide how we're even going to have a discussion about what constitutes yeah. reality? And for most of human history, reality was discussed through the context of mythology and then later in history it was through the context of religion and in the last couple of hundred years, in the West at least, it's become through the context of science. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting to me is the way that themes from mythology get reinvented first in religion and then in scientific terms, then that in a sense we're not really changing the argument, we're just cha changing the language and the terminology. And, and, and I think the, the idea of something that's immortal and immaterial that transcends us is, is an idea that constantly does play out. The idea that you could download your mind into cyberspace and live there forever is really just a reimagining of the Christian idea of a soul. Yeah. Me yeah. Medieval, medieval Christians used to have this concept that there was a thing called the glorified body, which was you know, not a material body, but it was, it was a body that could feel and feel pleasure and joy. 
And that was important to have a glorified body along with your soul in heaven because in heaven was supposed to be a place of bliss. Yeah. Paradise yeah. was where you were going to feel absolutely marvellous and joyful. And when you look at something like Neuromancer um, and Mona Lisa Overdrive, uh, I think it's in the second one, Mona Lisa Overdrive. Oh, well, this is William Gibson's second this novel. This is William Gibson's yeah, books. Right. Yeah, I mean, at the, end, at the end of these books, the heroes tend to get downloaded into some little paradisical world where they get to, you know, squish sand between their toes and, you know, surf in the beach with beautiful babes. And, you know, this is just another idea of heaven, and it's the <laughs> idea that you, you know, there is some immor- immaterial, glorified version of you that's not going to feel pain and happiness, yeah. but can feel joy and sex, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're not going to feel, you know, you, your toe's not going to hurt if you stub it on a rock, but you're sure going to love this, you know, the surf on your skin. Yeah. Um, so, you know... I find it really interesting that so many, so much of this discussion about simulation now is just really, from someone like me who was brought up Catholic, it's just so much like a Catholic concept. But these people think they're doing something that's completely the opposite of religion. <laughs> yeah, but they're trying, they're building it here on <laughs> Earth, right? <laughs> yes, and, and you wonder, George, so are, are we now going to create, you know, are our simulations, you know, are the Sims going to one day create their little own universe? Yes, right. I, mean, I, think right. I, I did like the yeah. end, of the piece that John Tierney wrote in the uh, New York Times the other day. I liked the end of it where he says, "So, you know, what happens when the creatures then get powerful enough that they can build their own simulations? So you've got simulations running on simulations yeah. running on simulations, and at, at some right. point, does the whole universal computer cram jam up?" Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. The crash, if the bottom level crashes, all of the. All of the um, routines running on top of that will collapse, but, you know, too. It's a, fu- it's a funny thing, in a way, that this whole idea has actually... We've seen iterations of this in a number of other contexts, too. I mean, this is the same essential idea of Stephen Wolfram's book, um, you know, A New Science, where he's basically proposing that the oh, universe yeah. is just a cellular automaton. Yeah, it's, right. It's, yeah, yeah, so that's yeah, that can be thought of as a simulation yeah. that it's uh, well, yeah, this idea that information is is at the fundament rather than matter and energy. Yes. Yeah. 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 And, and you know, it's interesting. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry I, I mean, I think that th- this idea that the fundamental metaphysical reality is information not matter it is really one of the major themes of our time. Yeah. It just plays out on all these different different stages. You know, one thing about cyberspace that, you know, fascinates me is, you know, you spend any time at all exploring the web. Even years ago this was true, and you just have this sense of this, you know, these vast, nearly infinite mm. reaches. And once I became very curious, like if you took the entire World Wide Web and figured out how many um, bytes of information it constitutes, and then you figured out uh, what the current state of the art was in storage mm. technology... How big would the World Wide Web be if you could just, you know, put it all on, on one server with, say, a RAID array mm-hmm. of hard disks? And it turned out that you could fit the entire World Wide Web into something about the size of a bedroom closet. Well, hasn't Bruce DeKale been archiving the web with the Wayback Machine? So Yeah, the Wayback Machine. And... Um, I think that was my original source, and then I, I, that's where I got the estimate of how, how much data it was. And then you could actually, I mean, now with storage technology, you know, probably anybody could, um, you know, with enough money could have the entire World Wide Web, you know, just sitting, <laughs> sitting in some cubes in their office. And, and yet, you know, it conjures up this um, feeling of being, yeah. being a space. It's really, you know, it's all, all, all this just wonderful yes. extended well, metaphor. My second book, The Pearly Gates of Cyberspace, is actually a cultural history of our concepts of space and looking at how, at least in the West, mm-hmm. our ideas of space have changed from the Middle Ages then with the rise of modern science and now with the r- rise of cyber science. And you, know, I think it's mm-hmm. really... Some people say that the word cyberspace was a badly chosen... Um, word, but I actually think it's a beautifully chosen word because it seems to me that when you are surfing the web or you know, you know, particularly when you're in online worlds, but I think even when you're surfing in the web, as you say, you do really have a sense that you're in a space of being 
And I think mm-hmm. one of the interesting things about the, the whole conception of space is that it really does transcend the purely physical space that modern physics articulates. Mm-hmm. And in a way, I think, with the coming into being of cyberspace, we've returned to a position that's really analogous to the world that medieval people perceived themselves as living in. Medieval people thought of the mm-hmm. physical world, the, the material space of being, as just one aspect of reality. Right. And the other aspect of reality was the immaterial space of being, which was you know, the realm of the Christian afterlife, the realm of the soul, which had its own geography and landscape too, which was heaven, hell and purgatory. Mm-hmm. And so medieval people perceived that, in a sense, they inhabited two spaces of being, the physical and the spiritual. And so with the coming into being of modern mm. sci- of cyberspace, it seems to me that once again we do inhabit, in some sense, two spaces of being, the physical world of our bodies, but we also inhabit cyberspace. And, of mm-hmm. course, cyberspace wouldn't exist if we turned off all the computers or, you know, leaked out the electricity system. But I think that it, it really no. is experientially a genuine realm of being and so I actually like the fact that it's called a space. And it seems to me one of the interesting things about cyberspace is it actually does, in my view, challenge the whole conception that material reality is the only reality. And I think mm. that a generation of kids growing up with cyberspace who don't actually know a world without it would find hardcore materialism pretty hard because yeah. experientially... How, you know, they do live their lives on cyberspace and they don't know a world without, like our generation knows a world without it. It's so interesting, though. You say it, it reinforces the idea that there's something non, non-physical that's real, but on the other hand, it's all very physical and, and comes out of, you know, just nothing more than the computer chips and the uh, mathematics of, of information. So in some ways, that's the sort of thing that convinces me that, that consciousness and this feeling of of mm-hmm. I could, um, you know, be similarly conjured up from purely, purely physical sources. Well, I, no, I, I agree. I agree with that. I, I mean, I, I don't want to suggest that we, a, a meta, what I would call metaphysical dualism. I don't believe that there is, as it were, some kind of substa- sub- substance beyond matter. Yeah. But I, the way that I sort of like to characterise this is that. I think there are two issues here. One is the metaphysics. Do you believe that there is something other than matter, yeah. some other substance, yeah. as it were, which is what medieval people believed, that there was some kind of, as it were, other substance, right. which was the soul stuff. Yeah. But whether you believe in metaphysical duality or not, there is an issue of ep- ep- what I would call epistemological duality. Mm-hmm. And I think it, the, the epistemology that we've had for the last couple of hundred years which is basically our philosophy of knowledge, suggests that the only knowledge that matters is the, mat- is the knowledge yeah. of matter. Science well, matter is only that matters. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's what I would challenge. I, I happen to believe that there isn't any, as it were, substance beyond matter, but I do yeah. think that, as it were, the knowledge of what matter is doing alone is not sufficient to, tell, to describe for us the experiences that are possible um, with the self, that the experiences that the self has. So it, yeah. in, in a sense, while I don't think the self can exist without there being a body for it to be realised through, I also mm-hmm. believe that it doesn't matter how much we know about physi- neurophysiology, that we are, that is not going to allow us to describe in any richness the experiences that the self has. I mean, I, I don't... Well, yeah, and that's probably true. On, you know, we, all, we already do understand how um, a computer works and... You know, really, in every detail, if you yes. at least you can get a collective a collective of people who would understand that, and yet describing cyberspace and really how it, and just really getting an intuitive feel for how this arises out of computation mm-hmm. is is pretty difficult mm-hmm. and 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 as it gets richer and, and richer it 's going to be be that much harder well i think i mean in, in a way, I think we 're already there because we are. Li- we are, as it were, living and having love affairs and meeting new people and having exciting experiences in this new realm. Yeah. We haven't, as it were, we haven't created another material world, but we have brought into being some kind of experiential. And, and, yeah. Oh, and yeah. So 
Although it seems like it really has a long way to go, though, doesn't yeah, it? I, do. <laughs> I mean, have you ever played around with Second Life? Just a little bit. Yeah, I, you know, it's... <laughs> it's amazing. It's utterly amazing, you know, music. Yeah, whatever, I, 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 uh, I, I, I tear myself away. I've only done it a few times, but I'll find, you know, I've been exploring this, this world for a couple of hours, and then it starts to give me a headache. Yeah. And, and then I walk outside, and I look at the real world, and I think, wow, God, this is just... So much better, <laughs> much better simulation. The fidelity and yeah, yeah, much higher dots per inch and everything yeah. else. But you know, in in a way, it seems to me, George, that this is the coming into being of something like cyberspace is a similar philosophical problem, and the coming into being of consciousness, or you know, the, mm-hmm. the idea of the self, is 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 a similar problem. To, to one that scientists have been thinking about for a lot longer, which is coming into being yeah. of life. So, you know, you start yeah. off with inanimate matter, you know, mm-hmm. rocks and oxygen and carbon and sulfur, and how do you get um, things that can move about? And then how do you yeah. get things that can feel? And how do you get things that can think? And ultimately, how do you things get things that can think about the problem of how do you get things at all? Right. And so, yeah. you know, this... In some sense, the fundamental problem here is the complexification issue. How, how do you get more complicated things from very simple components? And right. is, as it were, the behaviour of the complex things somehow predetermined by, the, predetermined by what we might know th- about the simple things? Yeah, so you get kind of this feedback and you know, almost kind of a downward causality where where this uh, you know, system emerges from the simple substrate through all these complex algorithmic processes and then becomes complex enough that it can affect what's going on yes. in the lower levels. And, yeah. you know, that, to me, is a pretty good, good metaphor for thinking how, how consciousness could, could yeah. arise from the but brain. There's a, very, there's a very basic philosophical question here that, that I think somehow we often forget that this question remains, and, and that is... It was beautifully pointed out in a book called The Metaphysical Foundations of Modern Science that was written in 1930 by a philosopher and historian of science called Edward Burt. And he pointed out that basically with the coming into being of the Newtonian revolution, that people believed that the metaphysical questions had all been resolved. So up until Newton, what he said, is the, the whole thrust of modern science was trying to work out what was the foundational metaphysics on which science was going to be founded. You know, what were the fundamental ground rules? Mm-hmm. What were our basic elements of reality? And with basically the triumph of Newtonian mechanics, scientists came to the conclusion essentially that the metaphysical problems had been resolved and that basically the foundations of mm-hmm. reality are matter moving according to mathematical laws through some version of empty space, whatever your version of empty space is. Yeah. And, and that's essentially been the metaphysics that we've rested on for the last 400 years. But as he pointed out, this Mm -hmm. leaves a a huge question hanging in the air, which is, does anything actually ever really evolve? If if that is our fundamental metaphysics, that it's just, as it were, dumb matter moving according to predetermined mathematical laws, it does imply innately Mm -hmm. that everything that can ever happen is somehow encoded in those laws. So there is actually well, yeah, at, yeah. there is no genuine scope for evolution. There is no real development in the world. Well, you get Poincaré's return, right? Where where everything will all you know any state of all the material particles in the universe yes. that exists in infinite time will yes. and, will, and, will re- know, repeat. And, yeah, but then you have to throw well, in the, 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 the quantum the card, right? Essentially, and, the twentieth century has been wrestling with ever since quantum mechanics, and also, ever, really, in a way, the problem is, it's the same problem for the, of Darwinianism. Does anything actually genuinely evolve? Is there real, is change real, mm-hmm. or is it just, as it were, a playing out of some kind of temporal um, version of the, the true fundamental laws which are ultimately changeless? So, you know, if you accept the fundamental metaphysics yeah. of, of 17th century science, then there is no such thing as genuine evolution. It, it is just a playing out, and change is, as the Parmenideans believe, an illusion. But many, I think most people, most yeah. hardcore 
terrorists to me don't even seem to really accept that. Because if everything is just a playing out of what was already predetermined and pre-written, then where's the kind of fun in that? In that? <laughs> I mean, you know. Quantum mechanics, right? Because then you have the, the quantum wild card. And, and then to get, uh, you know, to get everything being you know, in the cards at the beginning, you have to have this multiverse idea where every time you have a, have a quantum quantum event that could randomly go one way or the other, you spawn another universe. So I guess if you take all the multiverses together, you get back to Poincaré's yeah. return and the idea that everything comes back again to, again to haunt you with um, all the configurations of particles will exist somewhere in some other universe. And well, the multiverse idea is interesting because it just basically says absolutely everything that could possibly happen does happen somewhere. So yeah, right. So what does that way, get you? There's no real fun in that either because it's all just happening. It's all just this huge foam. But I think one of the reasons yeah. why people are excited by quantum mechanics is because, precisely because it does actually bring back a, an element of randomness. It, 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 it takes us out of the straitjacket of predeterminism because I think actually predeterminism... Yeah. At least in our own little, little universe yeah, here. Yeah, I mean, I think... Th yeah. There's something really deeply depressing about predeterminism. You know, if I don't yeah. have any real choice and the world doesn't have any real choice, we're all just going through the motions, well, why don't we just get it over with? <laughs> why are <don't laughs> playing it, literally playing it out? Yeah, the ride is so fun, though, yeah. Well, yeah, it's like Woody Allen wondering, you know, what's the point, you know, if you're going to die? But I guess Camus and Sartre and... A lot of other people. But there's also the issue if, if it is just different takes. If, on if that. it is just a playing out of predetermined of something that was predetermined, then why bother? Yeah, why well, as long as it's fun. Yeah, but it's fun. So is the is the fun? Pre, <laughs> I mean, it's the, the fun it's, it's the trip. Yeah, it's not the destination. It's how you get there. But don't. And, but don't you think what you the, see along the way? Life is yeah, the scenic yeah, yeah, route but, to but death. But the thing is that if it was all predetermined, George. And, and, I mean, surely half the fun yeah. is thinking that, that something different might actually happen than what was expected. I mean, if... Yeah. I, I, it's yeah. Yeah, you like to think that... Well, yeah, this is something that really bugs John Horgan, you know, that he really, you know, he really, really has to think that um, yes. you know, he makes choices and, yeah, and he has a free will. And, you know, I'm not so sure. I... I just this is something I've tried out on John, but uh, I'll see how it strikes you. But I always feel like whenever I'm beset with a big decision, like if I'm going to, um, oh, just to pick something fairly trivial, say I, I decide if I'm going to buy mm -hmm. or sell a stock, and um, you'll see all these reasons uh, to sell it, all these reasons to hold on to it. You'll go back and forth and and just kind of in this oscillating stage, and then at some point you just get, you know, so sick of, you know, thinking about it, you randomly make a decision, buy or sell, or, or sell or hold, and, and it's, you know, could very well just come down to a little random flick of a, of a neuron in your brain that, uh, you know, it's, was, you know, affected by a cosmic ray or some other random event. And then you think, oh, well, I've made a decision, but, you know, have you really? Well, it depends on <laughs> what you mean by making a decision. I mean, maybe the decision you yeah. made is simply just to go with the flow, whatever had happened at that particular nanosecond. I mean, the, ah, that's right. I had to make a meta well, decision. See, this is, this is what uh, proponents of the mm -hmm. I Ching say. They say, look, you know, at some point, you you can you can bring into be you know, you can rationalise an argument out the wazoo, but in the end, you actually do have to come down to making the decision. And some little tiny factor is ultimately going to, you know, determine whether you go this way or that way. So why not? Why not yeah. make it a throw of the sticks? Well, yeah, I mean, that's yeah. the whole philosophy behind the I Ching. That at the bottom of it, there yeah, is. Yeah, you save yourself all this agonizing, in which you have the illusion that you're making. Yes, yeah, but in, in in the end, you may as well do it on the random throw of some sticks as opposed to, you know, letting some neuron fire <laughs> in your brain at this particular moment in time. And I quite, I do actually quite yeah. like that idea. I'm with John on this. I really do believe in free <laughs> will. Um, perhaps it's the, you know, perhaps it's the residue of my Catholic upbringing, but I really yeah. do believe that we are moral agents, that we do have, we do have the power to make genuine decisions. Yeah. 
But 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 the, but that your moral agency and power to make decisions probably does emerge on some level out of a out of a purely physical substrate, right? Oh, since I think it a, emerges out of a purely physical yes, substrate. Yes, you're not a not a philosophical dualist. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. A, I'm no. I'd put it this way: I'm not a metaphysical dualist, ah. but I am. I am an epistemological dualist. I do believe that there are different uh. ways of describing the world that are not necessarily reducible to one another, but on a substantial okay, okay. basis. Yeah. I so, so yeah. cyberspace would be would be the other half of the duality, but at yeah. the same time, it, it, it arises from the first, so it's not co-equal. Yes, but that, but that would be an ontological dualist if you thought they were co-equal. I guess is that yes, a, um, but yeah. w- well, the. the it's basically, you know, what do you believe? You know, do you believe that there is, you know, more than one um, fundamental substrate? Yeah. I, I don't. I do believe that the, that matter, I, I, you know, in that sense, I think mat- I'm convinced by materialism, although yeah. that, that is an unprovable... Th- uh, well, yeah, 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 I guess that's, yeah. We can't, we can't can prove that, that there's anything beyond matter. We can't well, prove yeah, there's then, not either. And then even the most rugged materialist is, um, has to explain where mathematics comes from, right? And you know, how, how does that come out of the material world? Yes. And, and especially if you're talking about a cosmology where you're saying that uh, you know the Big Bang came out of the, you know, was was written into some kind of original pre-existing mathematical law of the universe, mm-hmm. and then you know where was the, you know, that would that, that would presume that mathematics. Math- mathematics preceded the universe, and if so, you know, where was it? <laughs> well, that's the classic, what's called Platonist argument. It's really actually a Pythagorean argument mm-hmm. that the material world is literally informed by a set of transcendent mathematical principles. And in that sense, I believe that most most physicists actually are dualists because they do believe that there is the material reality and this Platonic realm of transcendent mathematical principles. Mm, yeah. You know, the as you know, Paul Davis's term for this is you know the blueprint in the mind of God, mm-hmm. um, and, and so in that sense, I think most physicists really are actually they do actually believe in a kind of transcendent, deified reality, yeah, it just happens to be one that's purely mathematical, and, and and I actually object to that much. I actually don't believe in that realm of transcendent mathematical ideas any more than I believe in the Christian idea of heaven. And I think one of the great philosophical challenges of our time, really, is to try to articulate a non-Platonist conception of how mathematics itself arises. And there have been some very interesting attempts to do this, and one is by the the English mathematician Brian Rotman, Mm -hmm. who who wrote a wonderful book called Ad Infinitum. The subtitle of the book is taking God out of mathematics and putting the body back in. Hmm. And he's, he's actually arguing, I think, very convincingly, that in fact mathematics itself would not exist in the absence of embodied beings. And that actually you have to have, as it were, a new understanding of mathematics that is in its, that mathematics itself in some sense is dependent on matter. And this is, a, this is in some ways a much more profound commitment to materialism than anything that most physicists express in my view because as far as I can tell most physicists really are yeah. Platonists yeah yes yeah. things and yeah. and I think you wrote some other things that was that were really exploring this idea of um, you know finding mathematics rooted in the um, the physical world yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, oh, you wrote a book called Where Mathematics Comes From, How the Embedded Mind Brings Mathematics into Being. and Yeah, it's an interesting idea because computer science really has given us, you know, just in the last few decades, a way of thinking about that question of how mathematics can come out of a physical realm because if you think of a mathematical, if you think in terms of algorithms instead of equations, you know, algorithms are always physically embodied, and yet you still seem to end up coming... You know, up with this twist in the end where, you know, the whole system has to pull itself up by its own bootstraps. The mathematics that, by which the laws work and the laws which give rise to the mathematics. And you end up in this infinite loop and it really does sound more and more like, you know, we're inside a big computer simulation. <laughs> but then, wow, but I then convinced you, myself. 
but then you have the problem of what you know it, it just pushes the problem back yeah. one you know yeah. one level down then what's that computer simulation running on and where were the you know the beings who created that computer simulation then you just have the yeah. same set of questions arise so yeah. it comes back to you know the you know if the world is standing on the back of the turtle, what's the turtle standing on? It's, <laughs> right, turtle. it's turtles all the way down. It's turtles all the way down, <laughs> which is, you know, really why, you know, 2,000 yeah. years ago, Aristotle said somewhere the buck has to stop, and that's what he called the prime mover. Ah, so right. So if, you just pause if, the prime mover. And yeah, so, you know, is if we're simulation in somebody else's computer then are they a simulation in other computers so eventually you know is it computers all the way down or somewhere there has to be a prime simulator yeah yeah so it really just comes down to i mean you always end up when any talk discussions of these kinds of things you end up against this wall where you really can't go any further i mean there's just no way you can say why there's something instead of nothing, and you can't step out of the system. We're mm. embedded in the system we're trying to describe, so you come up with the limits of what the mind can possibly understand, and then you either posit a prime mover and you know take the Kierkegaardian leap into religion, or, or you don't. And you just figure, well, some stuff's not going to get answered, but um, the stuff that is going to get answered is going to get answered by science. Well, I mean, I think th th there are certain questions that are, as it were, beyond empirical determination. And th yeah. those are the questions that we sit around and discuss drunkenly at 3 a.m. in the morning. And <laughs> personally, I'm delighted that, that they still exist and we're still debating them after thousands and thousands of years. Oh, yeah, and every new generation discovers the same questions exactly. but in different forms. Yeah, I see, see. So, yeah, so, it, well, and then it leads to... It leads to the Pythagorean cult, or it leads to Christianity, or it leads to um, to uh, cyberspace, or um, even super strength theory. Yes, I mean, I, you yeah. know, it's, it seems it's to an me an interesting way to look at if it. If we, if these questions were resolvable, George, what would the next generation have to get, to get drunk? No, over? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. Yeah, then they'll have to. Um, yeah, the, and it'll be instantiated in some some different form, but boy, once you get to the point where you're seriously talking about multiverses, though, it's hard to hard to know where you can go from there. But well, I think in, in a way it seems to me the multiverse is a cop-out, because it's just saying yeah. everything that ever, ev everything that possibly could be is somewhere. Yeah. Well, you know, so there are pink unicorns, there are blue elephants, there are flying horses, um, yeah. you know, and, and we have another word for that, it's called f fantasy and fairy tale, and, yeah. and it it seems to me that the multiverse has just become a sort of scientific excuse for any kind of fantasizing and fairy tale telling, and that's yeah, fine. Yeah, so I mean, that's so you're 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 pretty close to to Horgan on that. Oh yeah, no, John and I agree totally on this subject. Yeah, I, I, but you you recently met uh, Sean Carroll though, right? And yes, yes. Yeah, now there's someone who would who would give you give you a strong argument against that. Did you talk about it with Sean? No, I haven't talked to him about the multiverse idea. What does Sean have to say on the matter? Yeah, or, or just super string theory in general and in, in the landscape oh, yes, and all of that yes. stuff. Well, I mean, yeah, yeah. The, land, the landscape has just become another version of the multiverse in that, you know, all possible yeah. universes could exist. And I was reading an article the other day about a study that had been done on the, on the landscape of possible string theory universes and people were actually looking at trying to determine the percentages of these other possible universes that might yeah. actually have stars that would enable right. them to have planets that would therefore enable them to have Earth-like planets that would therefore... Yeah, oh, yes, yeah, so you get this Darwinian, yeah, well, at least Smolin's take on it is, yeah. is something like that. But, but this you know, I just recently read um, L L Lenny Seskin's book, um, the, is it The Cosmic Landscape? The Cosmic Landscape, yes. Because, you know, I'm, I, I'm not... Is I'm, I'm not as extreme as John, but I am pretty skeptical of, of super string theory. And but but, I, it, but still, I just can't help but think that uh, there's something there. And I read read Susskind's book, and boy, by the time I finished that, I really could understand why people were embracing this landscape idea. And I don't know that I could even articulate it right now. I think I'll probably have to skim through the book again, but. Um, you can see why people, you know, were some of the smartest people in the 
world I have, have uh, bought into this. It's really a good book. Uh, yeah, I've read a little bit of it. I saw him give a talk on this subject a couple of years ago that mm-hmm. has a very interesting um, sort of little anecdote about it. He, uh, he was giving a talk at what was um, the, first, the world's first string cosmology conference that was held at um, the Institute, that Cavity Institute for Theoretical Physics up at UC Santa Barbara. Oh, yeah. And so all of the big, you know, people of string theory were there. And Leonard Susskind gave a talk, and Hawking gave a talk, and uh, Brian Green was supposed to be there, but he was off promoting um, his his TV miniseries of the Elegant Universe. Oh. So he wasn't there, but but all all of the big guys were there, and, and a few of the big women. And what was really interesting about it is they all basically gave talks that had a very similar format. They'd all get up and say, as as Leonard Susskind did. I'm going to start off with this set of assumptions and see what populations of universes emerge from this. And so oh, they start off right. with a set of assumptions and give this highly technical talk that was you know, pretty much beyond anybody um, except the experts. And, and then at the end of their talk they would say, and this is, the, this is the population of universes with these sorts of statistical properties that I get out of my original assumptions. And the right. first question that anybody asked was exactly the same question essentially in every talk. The, the first question was, why did you start off with those particular set of assumptions and not some mm-hmm. other set? If you start off with <laughs> some other assumptions, you would have got a completely different set of universes. Yeah. To which every speaker said the same thing essentially, which was, yes, you're absolutely right. I just thought this was an interesting and plausible set of assumptions. But yet everybody started off with a different set of assumptions and evolved a different population of universes. Hmm. And during the breaks, all of the talks was essentially people sitting around saying, well, that was really interesting, but it was just like some fa- fantastical story. But, of yeah, course, their own yeah. talk wasn't a fantastical <laughs> story. And I thought... You know, my, is, my universe is better than your exactly, universe. And and I thought, look, hey, see, I, that's, where all these, that, that's where all these alternate universes are being spawned, at the, you know, these people giving these talks at places like Kavli and <laughs> Well, what I thought is, you know, this, this is like having 100 Lewis Carrolls in the same room. Yeah. You know, how, many, how many impossible <laughs> things can we all believe before breakfast? You know, <laughs> right. It's fine right. with me if you've got four four billion impossible universes or even possible universes before yeah. breakfast. But how are we going to tell if any of them are actually probable or let alone exist? Well, it's what happens when you have to do this without any data, right? When you have to do what? Do, do, you have to do this without any data to anchor your assumptions. Well, exactly. And, I mean... I, yeah. I think it's wonderful. You know, it seems to me that, in a sense, mm. physics, as represented by things like superstring theory, has become a new form of speculative imaginative literature. <laughs> it's a new form of fantastical storytelling. <laughs> you know, I oh, think it's okay. a wonderful thing. Oh, you've got to talk to Sean. <laughs> he's going he's to have some interesting input, I think. But No, I... I I, I, I do take your point, and I guess the way I look at it is a lot of the speculative stuff of you know making these assumptions and exploring mm-hmm. what they call string phenomenology, also to um, kind of say, well, you know, if, if this and that is true, then we should be yeah. able to see this squiggle instead of that yeah. squiggle when we collide these two particles yeah. at the Large Hadron Collider whenever they get that started up. So it's kind of, in a way. Sometimes it seems to me like, you know, kind of spinning wheels, but on the other hand, you have all these really smart people who are sort of getting ready and getting this infrastructure in place, so when they do start getting data from the LHC, you know, a lot of them, at least they will have done some some thinking in advance and have these these models, so I think that's what's, what's been keeping them going. Yeah, the fact that they might actually be able to get some real data, I think, is, is the big yeah. hope. I mean, the, the, the problem but whether is that data be, will, will distinguish between... <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's going to be the problem. Between superstring theory and not is another if, question. If, if the LHC gives us some real concrete data, things will, can proceed you know, fairly rapidly, I think. But, you know, if it doesn't, you know, you could always argue, well, we just need a little bit higher levels of Well, yeah, you can always say we need more energy. But, and, um, and that's going to be the real issue. Because you know we've been ramping up in the, the energy levels in the search for, for instance, the Higgs boson to try to right. understand the origin of mass. Right. And a huge hope is the LHC is going to help us with that, as well yeah. as find some evidence of at least some of the low energy predictions of string theory. Yeah. 
if it turns out that it doesn't happen, then yeah. what I'll be really interested to see what happens with string theory. I mean, well, yeah, because you can always say that you know the particles we're seeking exist. Uh, you, you can declare the experiment a success. You say we didn't find the particle. That's great. We've put a new bottom level on how much energy you know it takes to uh, create the particle. But um, it, you know the, the fact that you know we're ever going to build another accelerator more powerful than the LHC if they don't find anything and just set bo bottom limit seems to be you know, pretty, pretty slight, and the ma so in some ways you get the theory of everything you end up with just depends on how much you can afford as a society to, you know, pay, you know, the, you know the best theory of everything <laughs> that money can buy, or well, except, that energy yeah, except can buy. One of the wonderful things is in the absence of data, we've got, you know, a bazillion theories of everything, and so, it, you know, in a way, the theoretician, the theoreticians are a lot freer to come up with, you know, all sorts of theories of everything yeah. that are, until we can, you know, limit them by the data. As long as, as soon as we start, you know, cutting off the field of opportunity because we've got concrete data, yeah. then the theoreticians, you know, are much less free to create. But it seems to me that I personally think that we're going to remain in this position for a long time because I think even the most, most optimistic hopes still suggests that the LHC is only going to come up with potential proof of some very low energy levels. Yeah, Higgs and, and, and maybe some super maybe symmetric particles. And yeah, maybe, yeah. Maybe some sign that you know gravity is leaking off into some other dimension. Right. The, the majority of what string theory predicts is, is going to be way beyond the LHC. So where do we go from there? And does mm. physics become... You know, the traditional idea is that physics, or all science in general, but physics in particular, is tied to empirical verification. Mm. Now, actually, I think that's always been a bit of a mythology that physics... Well, yeah, well, Susskind talks about the paparazzi, right? The, <laughs> the people that take the falsification idea of Karl Popper to an extreme. And, oh, right, right. Yes, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think that, you know... Popper's positivism has been taken, you know, actually yeah. most physicists I don't think are positivists. You know, that's the official stance, but when you yeah. push them in private, I don't think they're... I mean, I think most phys most physicists believe that essentially the equations and the beauty of the equations comes first, and yeah. that we have to be guided by our sense of mathematical beauty. Yeah, um, certainly the theorists. Yeah, and 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 I do I do think that in a sense physics has become, to, has become more unmoored from empiricism than the official rhetoric acknowledges, and that's okay with me because I think that one of the things I'm arguing in this book that I'm writing, is that in fact one of the roles of physics in our society has always been to be a kind of inspiring realm of possible enchantment mm -hmm. and it seems to me that one of the things that we need to start acknowledging about science is that it isn't just about building better microchips and getting us to the moon or mars it is actually to serve as a fun to serve the function of some kind of speculative imaginative fantastical dreaming mm. and that's actually a really lovely thing yeah that's a very nice nice way to put it you know, do, do you have a title title for your book you, it, I know it's, it, it's early. It, it does, yeah. The, the, yeah. the books, it starts off from a re, from a fairly radical position, which will probably horrify your readers, <laughs> the blogging <laughs> head audience. To it. The, the books about physics is a form of speculative, imaginative dreaming. But right, it's right. coming to it from the angle of looking at a guy who has no training in science, but he spent 30 years developing his own alternative theory of physics. Ah. So the book's actually called A Trailer Park Owner's Theory of Everything. <laughs> Wait, the, the trailer, the trailer park, and the theory of everything. He, this guy has a trailer park, but he has his That's own. That's great. Theory. He has his own theory of everything. That's so, a great title. So the book's called a trailer park owner's theory of everything. But I'm, oh, okay. I'm using this guy who has a trailer park and a theory of physics, a theory of everything, as a lens to look at the whole um, desire to have a theory of everything in our society. Wow, this sounds fascinating. And, and one of the things I want to argue is that for not for, not just for trailer park owners, but also for Nobel Prize winners, that the, the, the quest for a theory of everything is is not just bound up with the truth, but it's also bound up with sort of giving us, as it were, a kind of mythological context for our being. 
and it seems to me that physics with its multiple dimensions and its multiverses and its infinite landscape of universes has has really kind of taken on a mythological role in our society and it isn't anymore just about building better microchips and making electricity flow and, and actually I don't think physics ever has been really driven yeah. by that. Well we should talk about this book as it gets further along. I just noticed we've actually yes. used up used up more than an hour. Yes, we have. And, uh, Avoiding and I, and most I, of the subjects we originally yeah we were going to talk, talk about, about your, <laughs> the, the figuring the, the institute we'll, we'll just give we can still link to it the institute for figuring right yes iff dot, well it's called it's viff dot org yes and I, you know, I was looking at the website and, it looked, and this is something you do with your your sister who's an identical twin right yes yes so that seems to kind of <laughs> so wow that's kind of, sort of fits in with our simulation theme in some ways. <laughs> Well, they just hadn't thought of it in that yeah, way. Are, are, are you are you Margaret or Christine? Exactly. Well, some it's it's a strange thing when you're an identical twin because you do kind of feel that there's another version of you running around doing illegitimate, unauthorized things, and what right does it have <laughs> to run around in the world and say those things and do those things without yeah. asking your permission? It is. It is. At least like, it's in the same universe. Sometimes you wonder, George. <laughs> I'm convinced. Well, let's, let's do another conversation on that and identical twins and, and trailer park physics. And <laughs> this has been really great. Well, thank you very much, George. It's been a pleasure. Okay, well, uh, we can press the stop button and then um, I'll talk to you after that.